Welcome. My name is Françoise Claire. I'm head of classical and jazz music for the Centre National de la Musique. And we are uh, very delighted to welcome such a wonderful panel uh, of speakers today to explore a very crucial subject, which is um, the uh, question of young musicians, emerging artists and uh, employability. This is a very important topic. Uh, of course, the current situation worldwide is uh, making worries uh, among all young musicians. Um, how to start a career today? What tools, which programs, how to collaborate um, with orchestras, with organizations to start a career? So we are going to explore this subject today and I'm going to give uh, the mic to our dear moderator, Eric Denu. Good morning, Eric. And Thanks, Françoise. Thank you to all of you for being with us and see you soon again. Thanks so much, dear Françoise, and thanks to the Centre National de la Musique and your team for organizing this panel, which is about youth, indeed youth in classical music. And this is a topic, as you said, which is very much at the heart of so many uh, of our uh, initiatives and activities in the last 15 months. For this, we have the great honor to have a formidable panel of participants. Uh, may I start this time uniquely, not with a lady, but with a man who is the hero of the day. This is John Kizer from Miami. Uh, a warm welcome to you, dear John. Um, I follow up with um, Ilona Schmiel, who is uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Zurich. Good morning. Um, uh, Carola, Carola Royal in, uh, in Germany. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Chloe Fasota stayed in, in London. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and Thomas Zaruba in Paris, France. Bonjour. Absolutely. Good morning. Bonjour. So I will introduce now in the, in the right order. So Ilana Schmiel is the head of uh, general manager of Tonhalle in, in Zurich and was also formerly the head of the well known Beethoven Fest in Bonn. Carola Reul is the general manager of the Junge Deutsche Philharmonie. I don't know how to translate it. It's the Youth German Philharmonie. Can we say that? One of the leading youth orchestras in the world, in Europe and, and the world. Chloe Van Sutterstede is the music director of Arc Symphonia, a free ensemble and orchestra in London. He is also a, a conductor represented by a famous agency, Intermusica in London and is a trained viola player, if I'm right. Uh, uh, John, John Kizer, so is uh, formerly, as many of you may know, was General Manager of San Francisco Symphony, has been working as VP, Vice President of the New World Symphony, is still active very much with the New World Symphony in Miami, collected by Michael Tyson Thomas, as we may know, and is also the new head of partnership at Idagio, in Berlin, Germany, the web streaming service dedicated to classical music. Thomas uh, Zalba is digital head of the Salin Royal Academy. Salin Royal is nothing less than this um, marvelous venue in Arcisonnant, in um, French Comté, so close to the Swiss French German border. And he will tell us what is exactly this new built academy. May I start with? Um, Ilona Schmiel, maybe. The Ilona, could you please tell us a little bit more about, um, first, how the COVID context has impacted the organization, orchestra, venue, concert hall, and maybe tell us a little sm small, or not so, so small, rather um, large uh, insights about your new initiatives um, or the initiative you may have taken towards the younger musicians um, in your community in these last 15, 18 months. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, I'm very pleased to all my colleagues. A very warm welcome to everyone who is listening to us. And I think it's, um, it's 
crazy times at the moment. I can just say this in the, with these words. We are at the moment performing and actually rehearsing even in our hall with a huge orchestra. More than 76 players in the whole program are on stage and we are having in the audience 50 people. So these are at the moment the relations which we are dealing with, but uh, actually we are very, very happy that we are allowed to perform, that we are allowed to work. And of course, we are also doing a lot of streamings. But I must say that the most important thing for us is how can we find solutions during the last months, not only having the streaming as a digital offer for everyone, how can we bring everything in a parallel organized system back on stage, live and digital. And I think this is one of the aspects where the younger musicians are very keen and very talented in presenting themselves in this a little bit new world, I would say. And this is one of the questions, how we can bring them into our system. The bad news from the COVID time is when we had to cancel everything, we had to concentrate really what will we do. And we concentrated at the first beginning on the work with the orchestra, bringing them back on stage as a huge ensemble, not only trying to have just a few musicians on stage, but being on stage with a huge ensemble and also with all our interns, which we have in our orchestra, because these younger musicians who are in an education program in our orchestra, they have nearly no chance at the moment to perform just performing in the internet, of course, but uh, on stage, they have no chance to perform in the ensemble. And I think this is one of the issues which we have to uh, look on very clearly that the, the whole sound of ensembles is easy to change or you will lose even your capacity of having a sound with a distance of 1.5 meters between each musician, which we have. We are playing with masks for the strings, for the harp um, timpani or the percussionist. So it's not an easy life, but anyway, this is one of the parts. What we are doing with the Serie Jeune, uh, where we present very young musicians is that we ask them to play two, three times now in a row, very short concerts. Short concert means 50 minutes is the, really the maximum, maybe 40 minutes is enough. Then having a break and having each hour a concert or each one hour and a half a concert so that we can bring in 50 people for any of these concerts live. And giving them back the experience that there is a real audience. And we figured out that the, dis the difference playing for an audience, even only with 50 people, makes a huge difference and a huge energy impact for the artist, but also back in the audience for the public. And I would say one of the most important things for our future altogether is that we as cultural organizations have to find a mentorship model that we have partners, which means the people who are having a job in an orchestra, they took, uh, should take care for another one, for a younger musician who wants to be on stage in any different um, facilities and um, possibilities which we have, not only in terms of orchestra, but also chamber music, but also being as a soloist, but that there is a steady mentorship, a steady possibility to communicate. Then the next uh, stage is that we have student managers. This is a project which um, we really uh, started in Bonn in 2009. And these are young, talented, students at the age between 15 and 18 years old and they are having a trainee program for many months in our organization and they are the partners also for very young musicians as well and they are peer groups who are on the other hand very much interested how the younger generations are working together on stage in different arts projects of course but on the other hand, we need also to train and to educate the next generation of young arts managers, because if they don't understand the needs of the young musicians, artists all over the world, we will lose the connection. And 
there are some of these points we are doing that as well with our sponsors that I feel rent an artist is for every company at the moment one of the possibilities which we try to find out if this is something which we will offer for all of our partners who are supporting Tonal Orchestra and Tonal Zurich that they have a very very direct very close access to young musicians in our case and that they get the feeling that there is also a mentorship where we guide them through the other systems. And I think all the people who are working in our business and also in sponsor companies um, with whom we are working together, they're very keen on learning how an artist nowadays, how a musician is really coming over that crisis. We are sitting on one boat. I stop here. Fascinating. May I ask you if I understood it rightly? You said um, the young students uh, you wish to put in contact, close contact to some of your artists, or between 15 and 18, 18 years, old, years yeah. old. So they are still in the gymnasium. Yes. And they are, okay, okay, great. I, I presume rent an artist as an institutional program may resonate with some of our guests here. We come back to this. Um, so we come back to you, Elena, because there are also several other initiatives I know you have been taken. But um, I, just to summarize, um, uh, so these are really strange times to as much people on stage than in the audience. And not because the audience is not coming, because I'm sure you have 100% capacity yes. in the normal times in Zurich, yep. many more than, much more than 100%. Um, I, I, I found great your idea of, of finding internship models to be uh, to work everywhere and and having that sense of responsibility from the older generations already at work for the younger ones and this random artist model may i go may we go across i don't know what we do cross between switzerland and germany there is no mountain there um, a few rivers fine pardon <laughs> a few rivers a few rivers and bodensee <laughs> a little bit and that, 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 yes. that. okay anyway so we go straight north uh, to Frankfurt and to Carl, please give us some insight about the glorious history of the Jungle Deutsche Philharmonie, which started 40 years ago. 1974. Yeah, I'm not that good in math. Yeah. So it's, it's more than that. And, yeah. and so <laughs> how did you cope with the COVID? So your mission is about youth. So de facto, it's about young musicians, but how did yeah. you uh, succeed at having a symphonic body functioning more or less in these strange times? Thanks. We didn't. <laughs> there is no symphonic body working at the moment. That's, that's our problem. Um, to just go very briefly back, Junge Deutsche Philharmonie was founded by students who just left the Bundesjugendorchestra in 1974, because they realized um, when they were studying music at university level um, that they didn't have a possibility to train their art in an orchestra. And they realized that there was something missing. And out of the spirit of the 1968 years where democracy was a big topic and self-empowerment, um, they founded this orchestra as a democratic body, which is still how this orchestra is run. So it's the members who vote their board and the board is made up of students and they are basically saying which direction we are going with guidance. But it's, it's good that this spirit is still there, that the young people want to form their own future. And we're facilitating in the office. That's what we basically do. Uh, we usually have three big symphonic projects a year spring, January and, um, well, autumn, January and spring. And we were hit straight away in March last year because we were, I don't know, two, three weeks before a very big project that we had organized together with the Ensemble Moderne. We were supposed to be performing um, Espace Acoustique by Grisé and that just all totally faltered. So that was the first. Then obviously nothing happening in summer. We could, do a few chamber music projects and we were lucky that um, we had a so-called so-called freispiel which is um, a project every two years where the orchestra 
has a carte blanche and they can decide whatever they want to do. And usually it's a small festival or surrounded by, um, a piece surrounded by different art forms. And because it was the Beethoven year, they decided on Beethoven seven. So we started in March immediately replanning the, the entire thing, not knowing what's going to happen in September. And we were lucky enough that the summer figures went down, that things were reopened, that audiences were allowed into the halls and so on and so forth. So we played instead of with 57 people, we ended up with um, 32, reorganized the whole thing. It was supposed to be um, interactive with the audience. The audience sat in front of us as they normally do, which was really sad to see this project kind of having to be changed in that way. But we ended up with five concerts. So that was a real highlight last year. And it was one of the few projects within the Beethoven 2020 season that actually happened. So we've got material, we've, we made a film, we had a live stream, all of that happened. And then, you know, things went from bad to worse and we left, lost our New Year's concert and we lost our big um, April period. And because we are a decentralized orchestra, as soon as I start putting people together, everybody has to travel and they have to live somewhere. And because March didn't happen, we thought, oh, let's just move something into June, go smaller and just come together and rehearse. And even that didn't work because we needed a rehearsal space big enough to put 30 people with distance into a room. And there was no accommodation because um, that was all booked up because everybody who had booked for June, they all still hope that they can do something in June. So even that plan didn't really work. Um, in all this, we had to reschedule and redo our September 21 period. We are now down from 104 musicians to 46. Completely new program on the way. We lost our conductor. So all of that happened as well. And we're just now hoping that we can actually go on tour with five or six concerts in September with an audience of, I don't know, 50 to 100 people. So this is all what didn't happen. But what happened were smaller scale projects with chamber music. We had some sextet here, some winter project um, in Frankfurt with a live stream with an actor reading, reading texts in there so that there's a bit of a mix um, happening. We had classes for those musicians who worked in that. We are going to have a summer chamber music project also with one or even two live streams. So the smaller scale stuff was always possible because our rooms are big enough for small, small scale projects and um, ensembles. So we could do that. And what we've just finalized last week is an online ensemble con competition. And we're going to announce the prices today. And that was actually quite nice because it was totally the idea of the members they wanted to do something. They wanted to do offer something to their members for the lost March period. And we ended up um, receiving 10 videos from very different ensembles. And what was important for them to also have a focus on the educational aspect of this. So why would your grandmother or your aunt who usually listen to completely different music want to listen to your ensemble and that particular piece tell us? And they, it, it was, you can still watch it online and it's, it's really fun to see them and the work that they put into those videos. And I think they enjoyed that. And the prizes is coaching with partner orchestras and we will organize that live. We will not do that online so that they have some physical contact with some coaches and teachers and also put the end result then online again. So yes, we also had to go and use the internet to what was possible, but um, there is so much more you, will, you, you could do and you wanted to do, but you end up really reaching your capacity, which is also something that as, you know, as with many people I, I speak, everybody is just at the limit in organizing and reorganizing everything. And obviously that also hit us as well. We have a very small office. Okay, oh, what we, sorry, yeah. please go on, go on. That's go on. all right. <laughs> For the board, it was a very challenging time. Yeah, Usually exactly. the board the comes together in Frankfurt around six to eight times a year. And what we had to do, because I didn't want to take any decisions without the board and the members being on board. You know, that's not the spirit of the orchestra. 
So we got together by Zoom, not four hours as we usually do in person, but two hours, but every two weeks. And they've done that and they've managed that through. And of course they had their university and they had studies and um, they really were challenged. But I think they also learned a lot from it and also realized their own powers and their own, their own energy that they've got to actually make things happen. So from an organizational point of view, I think for the members and also for the programming committee, because they had to reprogram three programs with me and two of them are not going to happen. So a lot of work went into stuff that was still canceled, but we couldn't just cancel because things could have been different. And um, they, they saw the challenges of just simply managing all of that, what was going on. And I think for them that also widened their horizon. What Ilona also said, you know, the management generation that needs to come. I think they really got into this and seeing how we struggled and how we worked to, to keep everything together. And I'm really proud of them because they've done an amazing job being present, answering all the questions. How do you want to do that? Discussing it and having discourses about things they've done really well during that period and I'm really sorry for them that they were hit so hard by all of that because it's their responsibility and they've taken it on so that was really good oh, wonderful wonderful under your control they kind of, I must maybe put some background info for some of our uh, listeners who don't know exactly the German um, context so some of the first members of your university family in the 70s have become something like very, very famous conductors um, with premieres in, in Salzburg, like Ingo Metzmacher, or very, very famous agents like Carsten Witt in Berlin, or mystical figures like Dietmar Wiesner or, or Willy Wigget um, in at Ensemble Modern or Roland Deary. So um, this generation, which has had not to struggle against viruses, had already <laughs> built this kind of musician manager mindset, which has been quite helpful probably for their career. And let's maybe hope that that very young generation who is now facing at Union Deutsche Philharmonie that virus may become, um, some of them at least, one of the most leading figures in our practice and industry in the very, very coming years. That is mm -hmm. pretty much uh, possible. May I ask you something for more understanding and our common understanding? These are some competition. These were members of the Union Deutsche Philharmonie who decided to work together or, or was it open to other young musicians? No, it was, well, the, the, the entry level was that you had to be a member of the Junge Deutsche Philharmonie. Okay. But if you're a part of an ensemble like a quartet and you're the only member of the Junge Deutsche Philharmonie, you could enter that quartet. So we, we wanted okay. to keep it to the members, but if there was only one member, that's fine. So it's, it's very low key entry. Um, okay. um, Okay. That we that we tried to and get. maybe yeah. one more question, the last one for this cycle. Um, um, the members stay how long? Members of the New Deutsche Philharmonie? Is that a, a two years? Um, no, no, no. They they can stay as long as they like. They they the, the minimum age of entering the Junge yeah. Deutsche Philharmonie is 18. Yeah. Usually they start at around 2021 20, when they've had one year at university and they have to leave at the age of well on on their 29th birthday basically. Okay. So they could stay 10 years, usually it's between three and six years. And on the board, they are elected for two years, but they can get re-elected or just make space for some new person. Wonderful. Okay, let's Thank go you. maybe to uh, that we cross now something I know, which is uh, the channel. And, and we go to the UK. Um, so Chloe has created, Chloe van Sutterstede has created an orchestra several years ago. So please give us some more in, info on that. And he is also having, or not only starting, but having a career as a conductor in these strange times in which, as we know, there are not so many opportunities to be on stage. So please give us firsthand your um, feedback on this last month and the impact it has had on the uh, Arc Symphonia and on your career. Thanks. Yeah, great to be with you. And um, yes, it's been very difficult. My orchestra is young. Uh, I created it 10 years ago, nine, nine years ago. Um, it's called Art Symphonia for the arching of different forms of arts. 
In London, the market is absolutely crowded. But to me, when I started conducting, uh, let's say, when I was studying at the Academy of Music, so in 2011 or something like this, 2010, um, I, I felt I wanted to start a collaboration first with diff the different students from the Royal Academy of Music, the different students from the other College of Music, Guildhall School of Music and Drama, Royal College of Music. So it, it started as a collaboration, but then we all grew together and Art Symphonia became really a cross art because in my mind, um, I just couldn't see anything without collaboration. So we uh, do concerts with painters, we do concerts with dancers. I want to do um, concerts linked with poems, uh, but it's not, it, 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 it really is a, a program idea and then we link things together. So this is really the essence of Art Symphonia. Uh, it's been very hard and we have not performed together since the start of COVID. So it's been really, really difficult. Financially, it's very hard as well. We don't have many sponsors. Um, I just recruited two fundraisers that are absolutely great, uh, helping developing uh, the orchestra. Uh, we are becoming a charity. Um, so this means we can you know, apply for different uh, funding. Um, so this is kind of where we are at. But uh, at the start of, of COVID, I couldn't not do anything. It was really in my blood to, to bring music um, to my community in, uh, in England. Every Thursday, we were clapping for our uh, National Health Service, NHS. Um, and just automatically, I took my viola. I'm a former viola player. Uh, and I just played for them. And then I, I thought, I can do more. I can bring my orchestra. Uh, so it, it's kind of we never actually had uh, a concert together since uh, March, but in a way I bought my orchestra in the streets and we just performed um, to, to them. It was fantastic. Um, and yeah, this, this is the art symphony I kind of part. In terms of personal uh, career, I didn't do anything between March and September. Um, where I was actually busy playing for my for my uh, for my neighbors. Um, but then from September, I could perform in Montpellier in France with an audience. It was absolutely fantastic. It was really moving. And, um, and then I, I went to Borum in, in Germany. And sadly, the day before the concerts, we had to, uh, to go home. We couldn't perform. Uh, the soloist came, Paul Lewis came for nothing, actually. Um, but so um, it, it was, yeah, it was challenging, um, but it's very much opening now. Uh, I just finished three days with the BBC Symphony recording. It was really nice, and I'm, it's really, really starting again. Um, so, so with Art Symphonia, basically, I, I took a lot of time to think carefully of how we can put together concerts without, um, yeah, we, with social distancing. It's, it's very tricky because our space is a, is a church um, and in, in such a small space, we, we have to be careful. So I think I'm going to program, to start programming only for strings or only for winds and then see how we can bring together. And of course our, our audience is so, so excited to, uh, to come and, and see us, but uh, we are, I, I need to be careful and not to, 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 um, to think too, too big at the start. And, and you said you built the orchestra nine years ago. All they are the same members now. Yes. So have they grown up as a professional then? Exactly. So we all started together and then a lot of them, and I'm so happy, are either freelancers, uh, freelancing in London, which it's great for me because then they stayed uh, with Art Symphonia. And uh, so they are all, you know, at the London Philharmonic, London Symphony, uh, BBC, etc. A lot of them had uh, have some jobs now, uh, Liverpool Philharmonic, etc. So they, it's difficult for them to commit. Uh, but the beauty of this orchestra, indeed, is that we all grew up together from the Academy of Music, um, and we, yeah, we we learn from each other. I learned so much from them uh, because at the start I I studied a little bit of conducting, but uh, I just have to say that when I started uh, playing the violin at eight, I. I, I was straight away 
so fascinated by the role of the conductor. This, this was something, um, and I see this role of, of the conductor as a guide. So it's really a guide of how to shape the music. And I was lucky enough to have also a female conductor at the start of my career that showed me no barrier. And I, I knew I wanted to do this. And I used the tool of the viola and I used the tool of the violin to actually enable to be on the podium and knowing exactly what I'm, I was talking about. For me, it was very important that I did my studies on the instrument before uh, going into conducting where I did my master's in, um, at the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester. Um, so yeah, using the tool as the, as the viola was very, very uh, necessary. Thank you. I think it's very important to know that it is still possible to build an orchestra nowadays and have it developed, and that also in a in a in totally like the United Kingdom, when the public support for culture is sometimes quite scarce, and and one has to employ two fundraisers <laughs> to uh, to get uh, some kind of money. Uh, that's pretty courageous. Um, maybe later on, uh, dear Chloe, we we come back maybe to some. Um, I don't know, comparison is maybe a big word that, you know, what distinguishes our symphonia from more institutionalized youth orchestras like, you know, Deutsche Philharmonie, or, or maybe it would be interesting to see how, what were your, your, your specificities, yeah, your specific uh, pro profiles and options. We cross not only the channel, but we go right away through the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and and in and the Florida Bay. Um, so to to John. So John, you had um, you have been hyperactive during that period in which most of us have stayed at home. So you will tell us something about that. Um, you told me in a in a private conversation we had a couple of days ago about the dramatic changes at New World Symphony. You you had to uh, 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 trick and and that is absolutely fascinating. So please, um, let's start with that that first feedback, and we, we maybe come back later on 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 the other agile side of your work. Please, yeah, thank you, thank you, Eric, and bonjour à tous. So, a little bit about New World Symphony for for all of us is that it was founded 33 years ago by Michael Tilson Thomas and a Miami businessman and it is a postgraduate academy. So everybody at the New World Symphony has at least their bachelor's degree, most have their master's. Some have actually been working in the profession for maybe a couple of years. But the reason why it was founded was that uh, Michael Tilson Thomas realized that in the conservatories and music schools that actually ensemble playing was not taught maybe beyond chamber music, that there was no place for somebody to understand how the orchestra works. So uh, started said 33 years ago, uh, we have a campus. Uh, so, so just the mission of New World Symphony is to train these young musicians to be leaders, not only in their ensembles, but also in their communities. And we're also a, a laboratory of how music is expressed, experienced, uh, captured and taught. So I'm sitting here, not really, but virtually in our campus, which is a building, uh, we've now had it for 10 years, designed by the architect Frank Geary. And uh, Mr. Geary said it was the first digital building because we felt that digital was a priority. And in fact, there's like 25 kilometers of fiber cable, everything is interconnected. Our camera systems are all 4K. Uh, so, we have also a connection to what's known as the Internet 2 pipe, which is very fast and very clean Internet. So, uh, the curriculum for these fellows, and it's a three-year program, they stay with us, but sometimes they, they leave earlier if they've now auditioned for a position and have received it. Uh, but the curriculum is based around, of course, orchestral studies, chamber music, uh, and then also on top of that, we realized that there are skills for young musicians that are also not taught the conservatories. So it ranges from everything from uh, seminars on something like design thinking. So you have to focus on, on what, uh, what the audience is really actually interested in hearing. 
And uh, actually, Michael Tilson Thomas says he has four questions for every young musician, or any, any artist. The first question is when you approach uh, a work or, or something, just what is it? Understand what it is thoroughly. Why is it? Understand the context around it. What does it mean to you as an artist is the third question. And then the fourth one, which is for us one of the most important factors is, how are you going to communicate that to an audience? And why should they care about what you are doing? So there's a lot of work in that area of talking about how to, to be a business person inside the music world. Because really, every musician needs to be that. Or, and also, there's this word entrepreneur that's used a lot. But really, it's just understanding your strengths we teach everything from, as I said, design thinking to, I, I teach one about negotiations, uh, also a very important aspect of life. And we do also media training. Now, uh, so last March, uh, this is the story, slight story of the uh, Junge Deutsche Philharmonie. Uh, everything came to a live performance, came to a grinding halt. But we're actually in a good position because of our capabilities in the building to pivot to an online world. So over the past 15 months, we've all been in this situation. We've done 77 streams, or actually by the end of next week, we'll have done 77 streams. All these streams are characterized in, in, uh, in different sort of categories. There's been a whole series that the fellows, because this is a fellowship, put on, they designed, programmed, and put on a weekly series for a while called Live from Our Living Room. We've done some experimentation with pulling material from our archives, but bringing to them the uh, sort of a, a new look at it. And so sort of this format, which we think is very important of helping people understand the music, introducing not only the works, but also throwing in some examples here, listen for this as you go through. So a lot of various programs that way as well, as well as concerts. But again, we like to provide some context behind what's on every concert. Uh, one of the things that uh, happens is that, of course, in, in, in the United States, I'm putting on my New World hat, not after the pandemic, there was the murder of George Floyd. There's the continuing uh, violence against uh, various races. And then, of course, the storming of the Capitol. It was uh, a year where there were multiple challenges of how we were to respond to these societal and uh, very, very challenging, challenging times. And while I found my colleagues in other areas of higher education, uh, the people who were in the national organizations for, for higher education uh, were caught completely by surprise all these schools, we were on our own to develop our own policies and procedures. And so that is actually what we did. There's a few of us that also work very uh, strongly in distance learning, like the Royal Danish Academy of Music, the Royal College of Music, uh, the Sibelius Academy of Finland in the United States. There's the uh, Cleveland Institute of Music, a number of others of us. We also sort of work together closely to maintain the educational part, because we don't have any uh, uh, faculty at New World. It's all visiting faculty. Normally, we have about 120 different uh, faculty members who come in to work with the musicians. A lot of them are members of orchestras, everything from the United States orchestras to, to uh, the first desk players of Vienna Philharmonic. Uh, we had to do all that by distance. So it put a, a real stress on the staff because uh, they were there to maintain it. So we also looked at ways so that the fellows themselves could run a lot of this very um, a complex equipment themselves. Just to say that uh, the mentoring part that Ilona mentioned, I think it's worth coming back to talk about that amongst all of us because we found that you know, we have about 1,100 alumni who are around the world and they were extremely helpful in working with our fellows. And this really, so there's a, a lot of difficult things happen, but there was a lot of opportunities as well that happened during it. And one of them was this more personal connection because the one-on-one -on -one teaching takes on a different characteristic when it's done through, through the internet. 
uh, but also allowed for connections with our alumni and also Michael Tilson Thomas himself was able to actually spend time with each of one of our fellows. We had about 80 fellows. And this is, this is truth. This is not propaganda. No, this is this he is did. absolutely true. No, absolutely. Wow, but yeah, that's absolutely. remarkable. That's yeah. remarkable. Well, he didn't he wasn't doing any conducting. Yeah, but I know some other people we were not doing any conducting, we were not teaching one to one. Uh, Mr. Tilson Thomas is not the sort of person who likes to sit on his hands. Ah, <laughs> he is no, very great. active. He that's keeps great. going. So so I would just say in, in, in sort of closing the, the New World section is that uh, what what we have learned uh, is that, well, our challenge was that we were trying to educate a group of these young musicians for uncertain times. We did not know what was going to happen in the future. We, no, nobody knew. So in the end, uh, working with Michael Tilson Thomas, he said, what we have to do is train the musicians to be flexible, to give them the skills to take hold of the opportunities as they presented themselves. We don't know what those opportunities will be. Some of them came through in the pandemic, but we must train them to say, okay, ah, this, will you learn how to do that? Take, take, grab it, go with it. So we well, talked about I, the yeah. later. No, fantastic. Yeah, thank, thanks, thanks. May I ask you a very naive question? Um, how did it come that this orchestra was um, created in Miami? Uh, I mean, the, the French it? haven't done it in Cannes and the Junge Deutsche Philharmonie is not in Garmisch Partenkirchen. Uh, I'm sorry, the question was how did it, how was well, it? Why, why Miami? Why? I mean, we don't associate ah. Miami on the European continent, at least with youth. Okay. Well, that, that's a whole exactly. interesting story. I will, I will make it very short, is that uh, Mr. Ted Arison, uh, Mr. Ted Arison um, started this company called uh, Carnival Cruises. And okay. Carnival Cruises is based in Miami. He and his wife were in England and heard the European Union Youth Orchestra with Abado conducting. They came back to Miami. Miami was at that time a cultural wasteland. And they said, we feel as, as responsible business people, it's upon us to make Miami have more, well, to be more cultural and to be more aware of the arts. And so they started a couple of things. One of them was New World and they said, who, how do we start this? And a, a mutual friend said, there's this person called Michael Tilson Thomas. He has some ideas about an academy. You may want to speak to him. So they met for lunch in New York. And at the end of the lunch, uh, they listened to Michael's concept and his thoughts. And uh, Mr. Harrison at the end said, okay, we're going to do this. And he said, okay, we'll you know, start working on this, et cetera. He says, no, I think we should hear music in about four months. And that's, wow. that's how it started. And, I, I love I love that story. I hope we will have some politicians and mayors, et cetera, in Europe listening to your story. Wow. We love America, definitely, for that kind of things. Great. De great. Let's go to a, a, not a cultural wasteland, because it's a highly cultural place, but maybe a natural wasteland. So we go to the east of France, where there is a, 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 a glorious agriculture and also some glorious architecture. And Thomas uh, will tell us about this. So please tell us a little bit more about what is the uh, Saline Royale, what it has become uh, nowadays, and what is the academy within the Saline Royale venue? Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Eric, uh, for, for this uh, great intro. Um, Saline Royale is, um, is actually, um, is, um, is a salt factory, was a salt factory a couple of years ago, and uh, is the most beautiful factory, I think, on earth, um, as it is um, now part of the UNESCO World Heritage uh, for already maybe 40 years. And um, so if you type Saline Royale uh, in uh, any Google, Yahoo, Bing, or or any um, search engine, you will find out that this is half a circle, a perfect half circle uh, that is close to Besançon, uh, which is um, 
couple of kilometers uh, from uh, Geneva, and it's exactly located in the area where, where French produce Comté, the cheese. Um, and this um, this Saline Royale is a, is a place where there's a museum. Uh, there's the museum of Claude Nicolas Ledoux, which is a great architect that did uh, loads of works in, in France for Louis XV. Um, and one year ago, the president of Saline Royale had this great idea already for years, but got me on this project to bring up the Saline Royale Academy, meaning that um, this great landmark um, could uh, welcome students and masters from around the world. And the idea behind that is to do master classes. So one week master classes, uh, work, 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 and uh, everything located within this Saline Royale, uh, which is a place where you have a restaurant, a hotel. So everything is facilitated for, for the students and the masters. And this is the, 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 the starting point of, of the project because once we got all the masters, thanks to the help of uh, our two directors, uh, artistic directors, uh, Marc Copé, uh, the famous French cellist, and Jordi Saval, um, they, they gathered you know, around the world the, a list of great musicians and got them to spend a week in the Saline Royale with students. So we're already, um, we finished the fifth week, uh, like three weeks ago um, of, um, of recording because these masters uh, and the students, the idea behind that is to uh, record, film the academies with 4K and not only with one camera, but with four cameras. And then the rendering of the project is a platform like every one of us knows, Netflix or you know, video platforms that, uh, that give access um, to, to video content. And this content would be the masterclasses first and then additional content, of course. But the, the, the base, um, the, the baseline of the project is to stream these masterclasses with four angles, four different angles, and any uh, person that wants to see just, you know, the teacher's point of view or the student's point of view or the global point of view, or, you know, if it's piano, you have these um, cameras going directly on the keyboard, uh, whereas when it's cello, um, you have the camera following, you know, the, 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 the master and the student, and then you can switch from a camera to another one, exactly like we are seeing each other right now, actually. So this is um, a project that, uh, that, um, that is born in uh, beginning, of, I mean, last summer. And for us, COVID was a, a chance, if I can say, in a way because before COVID, nobody would have thought that teachers would come, I mean, prestigious teachers would be, you know, spending one week in the middle of nowhere, basically, um, uh, and students also. And then even the, the, the digital part of the project was like, no, but students and teachers need, you know, nobody would do this and that. And we saw that for the past 12, 30 months um, that teachers, are, um, I mean, had to do with it. Masters had to do with uh, this, this, uh, this pandemic. And, um, and, uh, and we're all really, I think, great human beings and great creators and very creative persons. And when something is not possible, you find other means and ways to get things possible. So students had classes through um, FaceTime, through Zoom, through Skype. I mean, um, very, very uh, analog people got onto um, working and dealing with digital practice every single day. And that is, there, there was no training. They had to go there. So everybody had to go there. I mean, there were, you know, bugs and everything and the, the sound didn't work. Oh, sorry, you're on mute. I can't hear all these things, but that's nothing compared to what digital can bring to human beings that are um, separated um, with great distance. And though that's one thing that it proves, I mean, COVID for us, it was really a, um, a launch, a, a great launcher to see that we're also um, legally able to, to get students and masters uh, 
within Salin Royal Academy, I mean, Salin Royal, the landmark, um, with official um, letters from, um, um, from the, the president because we were filming that and this is something that was tolerated by, uh, by the French government. So, I mean, we have great stories also on, on one student, he, he, he came from, um, from Barcelona, it took him 24 hours to get there. And it was the best thing he'd, he'd ever, you know, been through because it was 24 hours, I think a real, um, a, a real um, path. I mean, a difficult path to get to Salin Royal. And once he was there, he was like so, um, so emotional about it because it was this week he, he was going to spend. And the thing is, we also offered the possibility for every student to give a concert every night. And, 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 and these students were uh, in need they were craving for just, you know, to be standing in front of a crowd, even two people would be a crowd for them, but we had more and social distancing, masks, PCR tests, everything was made perfectly for, for, for the own safety of us and others. And, and they were so happy. I mean, I saw students cry because they were so happy, you know, uh, to be able to play in front of other people. And, um, and also for their friends to be able to see the live streams uh, through Twitch, because we, we started using Twitch to see if it had any kind of uh, interest or Instagram live uh, video or Facebook live, et cetera. And we saw there was a great interest from people you know, from China, from Japan, from, from France, uh, neighbors of the Salina Royale or people in Paris, in New York, wherever, uh, logging in and and watching live concerts from their friends because these people came from all around the world, basically. So um, I don't know uh, if, if I said enough or not, Eric, but... Uh, I, I, in any case, you embody perfectly the enlightenment spirit of the French <laughs> and, and this charismatic enthusiasm. Thanks so much, Tamal. I think after the, the very pragmatic lecture we got from John as uh, uh, how in New York, within a couple of minutes or hours, Someone decided to, to build the New World Symphony and later on the Frank Gehry building, the first digital building in the world, et cetera, et cetera. Now we have also a proof of the enthusiastic way uh, on the European continent we can still build a new entrepreneurial spirit. I must say the, um, the Academy from the Salin Royal is, is uh, currently financed not only by the public money in France, but also by a special private public fund yep. um, um, uh, from a bank which has been created, I must say, by under Napoleon time. So we also need to decolonize a little bit all of this, but at least it brings such uh, wonderful new ventures. May I, may I maybe invite you now, um, let's say we, we have here a perfect, uh, from, in some way like an Agatha Christie um, a thriller novel, um, the, the thing is, um, there is a crime. This is um, okay. The lack of demand now of, of, of opportunities for for young musicians. So my question, open to all of you, would be: If we were a young conductor, if we were a young instrumentalist, having have maybe that kind of experience like the ones at the Junge Deutsche Philharmonie, or we were a young singer, or we were a young composer, and we were now searching for a strong network. How and where can we start in these days, in these very current uh, coming months, where the opportunities for traveling are still scarce, the opportunities for meeting people are scarce, and there is a Himalaya of projects before every promoter in the world who currently knows that so many new works haven't been which have been com commissioned, haven't been performed yet. So many new opera projects are waiting for a premiere and so on and so on. But what would be your advice? What would be your feeling on this? And what are you doing in your um, institution to, to smooth that, that path and allow that young generation to have exactly the same opportunities as the older ones? had who wants to to start the first chapter of my Agatha Christie Carola please go on I'm happy to start because I'm in the very lucky situation to actually be one of the facilitators of networks for young people so what we've actually managed and I hadn't mentioned that before because I thought it was going to be a point we can make later um 
the young musicians at the moment are very much suffering of not having opportunities to audition because a lot of the auditions just simply didn't didn't happen because they weren't allowed to happen and we were in a very lucky position to have our own well not to have our own building but to have access to rooms so as everybody else we started on working out a new hygiene and distancing concept and a completely new way of auditioning and we've actually had I can't I can't give you the exact number, but we had probably about 10 or 12 auditions last year in June, which was with very low figures, but also in December where actually everything was closed. But because it was work and it was um, it was to do with with people and their their vocation. So we were able to, to have these auditions. They were safe. We had lots of measures making making it possible. And we were able to give a few of those people who didn't pour us um, the opportunity to become a member on trial. And of course, we have a few more members on trial now that we than we usually have, because before they become real members, they have to go through one working period where they are then judged by their peers if they are allowed in or not. So, of course, there are a lot more members on trial than we usually have, but we still hope that we can all give them opportunities to then, you know, come September, start playing again. And we are happy to have an orchestra of 30 members on trial because they've actually done their auditions and were were chosen to be um, on that in, in that position now. So yes, if there are opportunities for young people and young musicians to audition, go to the auditions. That's that's one of my my um, my advice that I can give. What I do here, and that's causing the students who are now doing their bachelors or masters and who are actually applying for those auditions, they have to send in videos for every single audition, which is of course clear because there has to be a pre-review if you know because of spaces are limited you can't invite them all that's one of the problems we had that problem as well usually we have with flutes 80 people come in they have a first round and then 40 have to go home after the first round and now with the COVID thing we had 18 people a day but every single one of this person played their concerto they did their chamber music and they played some Orchestra stellen. So actually, we had a lot better view of their entire abilities and not just, okay, they played the concerto, off you go or on you go. So, you know, of course, you have to, they now have to send in videos. And that's the real challenge because every single edition is asking for several different pieces. So, what they're doing, they're spending their entire days just simply recording for auditions. And the members I've spoken to, they're overwhelmed by this. It's too much, it's asking too much, and they don't know where their head is. And it starts getting slightly frustrating because the demands are just so much higher than they usually are now at that period where auditions are starting. And I'm slightly worried about that. We're doing it as well. So, you know, we have to touch our own noses about this, but it seems to be a problem that seems to be mounting, which I wasn't aware of. Is there some coaching opportunities? Maybe John on this? Is there something you have been yeah. teaching to your fellows? Yeah, it's Thanks, you know, this, Thanks. but yeah, but your point, Carla, is is well taken. It's the same thing here in that uh, you know we for our auditions for our organization they are completely online actually, which was a great opportunity because it used to be you had to travel to like either New York or Chicago or Los Angeles, and we would do live auditions. Um, but now, actually, those bar that barrier has disappeared, and anybody basically can audition, and they it's done live. There's a live connection. We send out a guide as to how to adjust your 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 connection and Zoom, etc., and how to position your your iPhone if that's what you're using. There's so it helps to keep everybody on the same level. But this year, we also started doing uh, interviews. So if we got to a certain a number of people and then we said, okay, we really want to know who you are as a person. We always have done this, but there's never enough time. And if you're focused on performing, then it's not easy for you. So we did a separate interview because uh, one of the things we're looking for in these young musicians is curiosity. 
We want them to be curious about how to move forward. But uh, in, in terms of, of just a little bit about, about training, uh, that's also where distance, uh, we wish the orchestras would all agree with each other and have what we call a unified application. If they could agree on the excerpts that each instrument had to perform, they could be make one recording and not many. It would be very, very helpful. That's just one side and something I've brought up with my colleagues. Uh, I also worked uh, as a co-chair with a musician in the United States on um, procedures. This was brought out of this National Association for Audition Support that was started by New World uh, Sphinx Organization Detroit. There's now uh, Chinike a Foundation that started one, was the European version of this, which we applaud. And that there is mentoring and coaching available through that program, as well as for our, our people in New World. We run actually, uh, as part of this program, what we call an audition intensive. It's a multiple day event where we bring in principals from orchestras, musicians provide, uh, prepare excerpts. Uh, they perform those excerpts for the panel. The panel writes up comments and then there's individual lessons after each one. And then there's also discussions about how auditions work, uh, but not only work, but some of the politics that are behind auditions. Uh, and it varies greatly from from, from place to place, as it does also from around the world. So that's for the uh, audition thing. Um, I just want to say that that my, my advice uh, uh, is that I, I hope that every aspiring musician has created a digital profile for themselves. Uh, I we would hope that this would happen before the pandemic, so it was ready to go, it just needed updated. But uh, there is, I think a lot of it is training in terms of uh, the points that some uh, that one of you said about no audience there. Thomas, it was you. There's no audience there. This is very difficult for, for the performer because they don't, there's this wonderful relationship between an audience member and a performer, and it's not there when there's just the lens and the microphone. So how do you turn it on? How do you get that magic flowing? You know, we're not like Glenn Gould, one of my fellow countrymen, who didn't want an audience ever. Uh, but no, this is something that's very difficult. And I think that takes also some practice. So another thing is just working and getting every opportunity you can to, to make videos and to watch them yourselves. Some people say, I never like to watch a video myself. Not the right answer. That's how you really learn is how you look on the camera, how you are able to talk about something on camera. All that is extremely important. You know, several years ago, I was doing a, a, a seminar with a, a, an orchestra a, of young people. They shall remain nameless. And, and I asked them, I said, who here has your own digital profile, something up your own website, et cetera, out of maybe a hundred people, maybe about, 12 or 13 people put up their hand. Oh. I said, oh, I said, you know, I said, you know, there are some people who say that if you don't have a digital profile on the internet, you actually don't even really exist. Mm. And I was booed. And I said, well, how do you think this is going to happen? They said, well, when we join an orchestra, the orchestra will take care of it. And I said, really, you're going to let complete strangers handle your or portray you as an artist to the world? That's something that you need to control. This is your brand. This is who you are as a person. You need to have control and you need to know what the tools are to make the control. So on the distribution side, I'm now going to put my Berlin hat maybe, on. Maybe, maybe Joe, oh, before that, we, no, I come back to you. Um, maybe some comment from Ilana. I just wanted to, to uh, cheer the fact that you mentioned you were a Canadian and I wanted to give an affectionate hello to our Canadian listeners who are several and, and and I wanted to tell them stay tuned because in the next web online seminar we'll have in a month there will be a very important colleague of of you from Ottawa please Ilona go on I'm I love listening to you both uh, Carola and John when you're talking about auditions and the new versions uh, when you have the discussion 
with an orchestra like the Tonal Orchestra, one had more than 150 years old, they feel that they have their regulations and that they shouldn't change it. And even COVID shouldn't change it. But right now, <laughs> we, we are doing as well the first round um, by video sessions. And of course, uh, let's have a look what, what will be the, the result at the end. Um, but I mentioned one of the, the professions uh, at the moment, they have really huge problems as well. And these are the conductors like Chloe. And therefore, we, we have a Conductors Academy, which we founded with uh, Pablo Yavi originally last year when he took over the music director's position with our orchestra. And uh, last year, we couldn't do it. Uh, in March, we had to cancel it. And now this year, in two weeks, definitely we will start. And the idea behind is that we have, of course, masterclasses in this academy with Pavo together with our orchestra, but that we have also on the other hand, the questions of how we give them a management training as well, and how we guide them through the process. What is, are the next steps? How could they come into a network? How could they be with us also for the future? So that we, even if we don't have them every year, uh, with our orchestra back that we can recommend them to other people, to other colleagues, to other ensembles, but also giving them really perspective what they can do even in these times where it is so hard if you don't have an ensemble to conduct, what are you doing? And I felt that especially this group of, of professionals that they are really very, very lost. But on the other hand, if they are real leaders, they have the capability even to learn a lot out of this crisis. And I can only also say for our institution, it's the biggest crisis ever in the whole history because of this idea that we have no idea what are the perspective at the moment. And these not knowing future, which you mentioned also before, I think this makes all of us very nervous on the one hand, on the other hand, it's so exhausting <laughs> if uh, no one knows what is going on, but giving them a perspective and trying to help them is something which we found out is giving also back the energy into a team because you, you get so many, many aspects from all the people whom you are at the moment uh, then giving a lesson or helping someone is something which gives so many aspects back. And normally we would have a huge audience and they are allowed to vote and uh, to give the next perspectives to other masterclasses or academies. And um, we are in the lucky position that we have a financial background for this academy that we can bring them also to Pernu, to Pavos Academy there uh, with other conductors together. And uh, the public can vote for their uh, student they want to bring her or him to the next um, academy and uh, giving them a public prize. And this we are doing now also online because definitely it's possible via streaming that they are with us. And these happy 50 people in the hall, they, they have the real feeling and maybe have some other possibilities to be with us. But uh, we use all these aspects and organize it is again by these uh, former student managers and they are giving the impact who are the next audience, how we bring them together into the hall. So this is also one of these examples where you can bring many people together even during those times because you have only, we had to reduce the number of participants, normally eight to 10, now we have only six because of all the quarantine regulation and all the challenges, but we managed to have for these six people at least coming from very, very different countries, um, the possibility that they could um, take part in this academy. So this is also one of these aspects which I want to point out, um, try to, yeah, for everyone as an advice, try to make it as flexible as it could be at the moment, but if you want to go in leadership positions, there is now right a good time because um, also I uh, love to give knowledge to people and um, I have at the moment sometimes more feedback and possibilities to do this than in the normal business and um, it helps to 
uh, reflect with young people together what is our common future and we have to build them together thanks i, I love that the sentence you know the best time to learn about leadership do it, do it right now maybe maybe before we come back to john and the capacity of streaming services also to help people we, who had no records yet or you know no recordings at all or no name um you, so you said six people will um, eventually be there eight we have planned just to give us a short um some optimism and 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 hope i love that quote by pavo yeri your music director he said my biggest concern when choosing the students is that there were at least eight other people i would have liked to have selected so that means we you had brightest choice and that's Bad news for Chloe, so much competition. No, that's, that's also good. Um, and people come from uh, Europe, but also Korea, Taiwan, People Republic of China, of course, and, and, and probably some North American will be there next time. So, um, so we, we still have a very, very attractive uh, practice and, and, and industry. Please, John, um, some words about how uh, a leading service like Dagio which is like some others, we, we know Prime Phonics, Vialma, Cobus, etc., yeah. uh, trying to evangelize uh, people uh, on the earth on the fact that listening to classical music um, is, um, is a very important part of life and should be done also in a parallel way to, of course, attending concert halls and opera houses. So how can it be used for people who are not Anna Sophie Mutter or, or, or Paul Lewis, um, uh, which has been mentioned. Um, and it's always good to be one day in Borum, by the way, um, and um, uh, um, et cetera. So how, what, what is your strategy there? So the, uh, and, and uh, you probably all know Adagio started as an audio streaming service and they worked very hard on their metadata, et cetera. Then at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, uh, to develop the global concert hall, which is a video platform. And so uh, I came on board uh, earlier this year uh, to think about how can this be a service to not only institutions, but also to artists, to uh, and artists in terms of also composers, because I think that's one of the other areas that's been very, very difficult for, for composers, um, especially if this is no live concerts, they're not receiving revenue from that. So uh, in, in our work at Adagio, we, we thought about how we could create, right? So actually it's called a, we're calling it a creator platform because uh, there are certain aspects that are, that are required, tools that are required, uh, we think for, for every artist, whether they be composer or, or instrumentalist or, or vocalist, and you know, they need an online home. So what we're working to do, and we hope to, to bring this out in the next, within the next month is to create sort of an online home for, for artists. And it includes uh, various tools because of course as an audio player, we have the ability to, what we say, white label publish uh, audio recordings. Uh, there, so there's the whole self-publishing. We, we are also have distribution to whether it's Apple Music or Deezer or, or Spotify, Amazon Music. So there is a distribution point for that, for that artist. There's also the video player in the global concert hall. And then we're also looking at bringing in also a teaching element as well. But I think somebody talked about master classes and Thomas, your very interesting way of, which I think is fantastic, of giving people a choice as to what they see um, uh, I might want to steal that idea, I'm afraid, but uh, we'll make sure that you have the credit and maybe we should talk actually about how we can bring those into the Adagio because I think the learning aspect is also important. So on top of that needs to sit the ability to manage your community, whether that's through Instagram stories or some people for the older generation, Facebook, uh, there also needs to be instruction about how to use social media in a business way. And uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Martin Zimper, who I think was also on the series some time ago about, about influencers, etc., from the Zurich University of the Arts. V very important, uh, all this area about how to build this community online. And then how you deal with your, your fan base uh, through emails, etc. Again, this is something which 
which I think uh, where we can be very helpful with. And then ultimately that builds to payment. But until you've actually established these building blocks in this sort of like pyramid, you don't get to the, you don't get to the payment part because you have to have that fan base. You have to use your resources as well as the resources of Idagio to build that. So that's just sort of the overview. Uh, as we say, we, as that we hope to have this up within the next month to provide it for artists and also organizations too. It's the same kind of challenges for them. Right, right. Also, maybe Ilona, I, I mentioned uh, earlier, you have been also part of different um, initiatives like the Ricordi Lab. Tell us a little bit more about what, what, what it is and, and um, how did you, in times which were, if I remember well, pre-COVID, how you, with your, some of your colleagues, or eminent uh, colleagues also in the business, uh, chose, if I remember well, three composers from different um, aesthetics and, and uh, geographical origins, and so that they may be, you know, uh, starting a career in this, in this harsh jungle, which is modern um, music um, composition. Yeah. Um... I think it was a very interesting process because we had also recordings, we had filmings, we had lots of scores, which uh, we could really try to judge about. And every we were not talking with each other in the jury. This was a very interesting part. So everyone had to do this uh, alone. This was one of the aims to find out if we coming from totally different art fields or music um, business fields, if we are judging in the same way and the very interesting thing was at the end that we had we found at least three composers where we were totally clear all of us that these three should be really supported also in the future and that they could get a contract with uh, some editors and so this was one of the ideas bringing in the composers in that world but also giving them a perspective that they have more and more a possibility to get visibility and these, with this visibility and uh, together with, of course, some, some of the possibilities that technically uh, they know they have to do much more, as John said, everyone has to have this profile. This is even for some of, com of the composers, it's out of their world. And uh, especially in the avant-garde, uh, I have sometimes the very strange feeling, the more avant-garde they are, that the more against some of these um, technical equipment and support. So they're, they're totally different angles where they come from. And it's an interesting process and to support them to come into the process that they get more and more um, possibilities for their new compositions. Thanks, oh, great. Chloe, maybe you reached the kind of grad being represented by a London-based agency. We know London is the international hub, one may say so more or less for representing uh, the best talents in our industry. So can, can you give um, some advice to your colleagues, instrumentalists or, and or singers and or conductors, of course, of how you can have um, that um, capacity to attract the attention of some of the, of the leading artists, managers, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and then have a kind of passport to have at least your name being mentioned when it's about um, uh, uh, hiring some some good artist uh, or brilliant artist to some major place. I can maybe I can just start with uh, how I met my manager. Uh, maybe this can be yes, please. to be very honest. Uh, so when I was studying at the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester. The beauty of this course is that we are in partnership with the BBC Philharmonic, Liverpool Philharmonic and Halle uh, Orchestra. Uh, we are always uh, active. Our ears are always active. We are assisting there uh, all the time. And I was assisting at the BBC Philharmonic. Uh, and after the concert, uh, uh, of course, I congratulate the conductor. and. Uh, Simon Webb, who is the, 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 the head of the, the director of BBC Philharmonic, uh, asked me if I want to join the, the, the dinner afterwards and, uh, and sat next to uh, his agent, uh, to Ben Jennings agent. And we just chat uh, very normally, not even about music. And uh, this is my manager now, Leila Gunesh at Intermusica. Um, but before that, if I can give 
uh, an advice to young conductors uh, who are listening. When I started uh, my master's, uh, I didn't, I straight away said to my teachers, at the end of my uh, master's, so in a year, in two years time, uh, I would like to have already uh, engaged with some managers. It doesn't mean that I need to be signed, but I wanted to, to engage. I would like to be selected to maybe a competition. I'm not uh, someone who, who, who defends competition, but I think it's a, it's a good way to, um, to open doors. Um, I've done three competitions, Besançon, uh, London Symphony, and uh, Dirigent and Price. Um, and all of them were really uh, interesting in terms of opening doors. Um, but for the managers, staying true to staying true to yourself, uh, explaining, I had to explain to a few managers I met in my first year that I was not yet mature about uh, having a manager because straight away you can be launched into this, uh, let's say it's a cage, well, like a, a world of uh, very, very feroz, feroz, comment dit feroz, um, bitey and difficult Ooh, world, cruel yeah, world yeah. in a way. Ferocious. Ferocious world. Um, you have to be ready. So Leila really listened uh, to, to what I, I was as a person, I was as a musician. She came to a few of my concerts with Art Symphonia. She came to my, um, some debuts actually that I had with the Royal Philharmonic before I got signed. Uh, and it, 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 it was really an organic for me. It's a very important to, be a, to have an organic uh, relationship with a, with a manager that uh, if we want to be having, a, I believe in, of course, in a, a long and steady uh, path and not fast and uh, fiery. We know that uh, some winners of competitions, conducting competitions, uh, just can disappear very quickly. And for me, it's important that I keep a, a long and steady relationship. Great. If we have five more minutes, I know if it's allowed by Centre National, I hope so. Um, um, thanks so much, Francois, for allowing us five more minutes. There is a topic uh, I would love also to, a, a concluding one. Um, and it has been mentioned already more or less between the lines. We also have to do with audiences. And a good sign of these uh, COVID times is that we know from web streaming services that the audience for classical music has expanded a lot. And that many, many young people under 35 at least are listening a lot to playlists, including some of our repertoire, maybe not knowing exactly what they are listening to. Someone like Paul Lewis, it has been mentioned, is one of the uh, leaders in the, uh, the party for uh, uh, nowadays, is topping way above many pop music artists, um, due probably to you know some playlist and also to his, of course, exquisite capacity to interpret uh, Beethoven sonatas among many others. Uh, uh, great works of our repertoire, but audiences are, of course, in democratic societies or um, also in in, uh, um, in in the far east through other ways uh, represented in the boards, in the people who give money, finance, and decide politically. Um, how do you see that? Um, what is exactly the impact of our practice of our repertoire of mindset as a whole, as a community, as a social body, we classical musicians, um, towards these people, the elite, the financial, economic, political, social, sociological elite, um, how we had last month's uh, topic uh, dedicated to diversity, gender, equity, inclusion, um, maybe we could articulate that topic to, just today with our topic on the use. How do you see that? What are the perspectives and which advice should we give to ourselves on, on this? I don't know who wants to have the, one of the concluding sentences on this. Ilona, maybe? My advice would be, um, please connect interdisciplinary politicians, economy, musicians and all the education programs and you need always one person from one part and bring them together as new quartets and i'm absolutely sure that they will perform and i think if i would be a politician i would uh, install such a supporter program 
and would give money exactly for things like that, developing new constellations and helping the arts and learning from each other. I think that uh, this is an Done. exciting time because uh, in, 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 in America, I'll speak from the American perspective, uh, this has brought forth a whole new area of scholarship and discovery because a lot of these, these composers, these underrepresented composers, uh, they weren't able to get publishing, publishing. So a lot of their music is in manuscript form. I was actually just talking to somebody in, at, at Amazon Web Services about could machine learning help us take those manuscripts and create orchestral parts, give us a MIDI file so we could hear it because we have a lot to discover here. And there are a number of funders, at least in, in the United States, that are very much focused on, on making sure that this, even Amazon are interested in making sure that these works are now going to see the, see the light of day. So it's going to be very interesting. It's an exciting time. Right. Carola, Chloe, and Thomas. Uh, maybe just one thing yeah, on the digital, uh, what John said about you know um, personal branding, that's so important. Yeah, that's something maybe um, we should be also you know more um, in a, in a, not training, but um, evangelize, uh, evangelize, I would say in France, because um, um, it's not a question of age. Uh, the Saline Royal Academy Instagram account, for example, is already counting more than a thousand um, subscribers, and it started from scratch, like um, you know, a couple months ago. And what we saw is not a question of age or or anything, because we have students like 16, 17, 18 years old using Instagram, and while traveling to the academy, already posting videos in the train and saying how excited they are, and also posting photo of the food during the academy and the restaurant. And this is creating, you know, um, content, content, content. Uh, around the academy and, and around them as a, as a musician, as a professional, and as a, as a future professional also. So that's great for their own uh, personal branding and their audience, how they get together um, also physically with um, um, pianists, uh, violin players, flute, oboe, and all these guys that are not uh, used to speak to each other um, when they're going to academies because it's only piano uh, here violin there they're all mixed up together and that's great in terms of you know for the future in terms of one day they might be you know cooperating in an orchestra you never know and um and that's uh, on, on an also a digital perspective uh, and very personal because um, I'm also a pianist and composer. Um, in 2016, my album, which I launched from scratch, got up to a best-selling independent uh, album in France, uh, just thanks to social media. And I did everything by myself. I went to Prague to do the recording. I didn't know anything about recording. And it just means that today with the tools we have, and with this beautiful connections we have, like the internet can do marvelous things. And so I know that my music is, is, is listened to, in, you know, in Australia, in Canada, all around the world. I also have, you know, blue vinyl and people buy it. And, and I, I was never in a shop. You know, there's also the transformation of, of behaviors around the world and being on Spotify and, and Deezer or, or any other platform is like being in a shop and getting your, um, your music available for the ears of the um, of human beings, and, and and that's great. I think it's a it's a great message to send out to the crowds that uh, digital is a great opportunity for, for 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 musicians and for and and that the all the all the, the prof professionalization of um, of this uh, industry has to 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 take place right now because otherwise you know the train doesn't doesn't come twice as we say in France you know. I doubt we can find better concluding words. Uh, maybe <laughs> except Amanda Gorman's fantastic lyrics on now, now, now. So now it's up to Francois and now it's up to me to thank you very much from the, my lip of my heart uh, for, for that fantastic conversation we've had. And I hope these advices will uh, profit to all our fellow musicians all over the world. Um, they just have to wait now uh, uh, um, maybe for, for, for better 
more vaccines, a little bit more, I don't know, worldwide regulation and uh, one, one word or at least one health for, for, for everyone. So back to Paris and Centre National de la Musique. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you for this uh, fascinating discussion. Obviously, we can't live without the internet and the di digital world. I think it's really the way to move forward for all our young musicians. And thank you for your input and suggestions and uh, uh, feedback of experiences. We are very thankful for your participation and uh, to our audience and to Eric. See you soon again and uh, take care in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.